Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for the District D Candidate Forum. Um, I, we, this is hosted by Wake Up Wake County uh, in partnership with over a dozen of our awesome and incredible partners that uh, have come together to reach out to um, many, many of the folks that don't usually end up uh, turning over their ballot in uh, midterm elections. And we're hoping that we can reach more of those 250,000 expected voters to vote for local elections because of the, the issues that these four people are going to tell you about why and how they affect your daily lives. Um, my name is Nathan Spencer. I am executive director with Wake Up Wake County. I've been instructed to do better about following my my uh, notes here so um i uh we have if you need interpretation with uh bach over here bach do you want to come over and just let folks know uh they need it si alguien necesita equipo de traducción para escuchar en español estamos aquí atrás o levantan la mano y yo vengo y les traigo uno vale Thank you so much. Thank you, Bach. Uh, interpretation is uh, presented by El Pueblo and provided by El Pueblo. Um, and um, uh, we are excited tonight because we have our moderator, uh, Robert Bob uh, Kubak, uh, Ku yes. <laughs> um, who is, uh, he is the former executive director of the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. Um, so, uh, before we sort of go into full introductions, I, I want to do a couple, I want to say a couple things. We are extremely grateful to our sponsors, um, specifically Blue Ridge Corridor Alliance, uh, Hillsborough Street, uh, Community Service Corporation, and AARP. Um, uh, WRAL is live streaming this, uh, forum right now. Um, so this is going over on the web. So we are catching people who are not able to be here in person and uh, they are going to be able to ask questions just like you. You have note cards over here um, at the back table where you can write a note and say, I have this question. They um, can tweet or uh, send messages using hashtag VoteRaleigh22. Uh, so now our um, now for our moderator, uh, Bob retired after working as executive director of the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency since 1987 with over 45 years in a career in the career he managed local state and federal affordable housing programs in Michigan, Idaho, North Carolina. Uh, we're pleased to have his expertise here. One of the benefits of having experts like this in our area is that uh, when we're asking questions, he is helping to very much guide what is affordability and how that works. And we're excited to have his expertise in this forum and being able to ask our candidates questions. Without further ado, let me introduce Bob. Well, thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, my name is Bob Kukab, and Nathan, I don't always use my last name because I can't pronounce it half the time, so <laughs> not to worry. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with all of you this evening so we can talk about some issues of concern and importance to District D. Uh, I want to add that I'm also a, a proud board member, active uh, volunteer with Wake Habitat for Humanity, a single family home builder. Uh, and Wake uh, Up includes Wake Habitat for Humanity as an active member. So before we get started, I, I have a couple of housekeeping things. First, turn off or silence uh, any pesky cell phones, anything else that buzzes. Second, to respect the uh, flow of the dialogue, please remember to refrain from applauding or commenting while candidates speak. You can interact with them after the session concludes. And candidates, when speaking, please pace yourselves. Watch the time and be courteous in exchanges. Uh, civility counts. All candidates for city council run for two-year terms. Uh, in addition to voting on a district seat, everybody will vote on two at-large seats 
and also for mayor. Uh, tonight we're going to meet the candidates running for District D. This is a seat currently held by Council Member Stormy Forte, who is running for an at-large seat, and four people are running to succeed her. All four candidates were invited, and thankfully all four candidates have agreed to be here. Rob Baumgart, Jane Harrison, Todd Kennedy, and Jennifer Truman. Over the past couple of weeks, Wake Up and Partners held forums for districts A, B, and C. The partners will hold their fifth forum for the at-large candidates on Tuesday, September 27th at ArtSpace. All candidates and these forums are nonpartisan, which means that they're not affiliated with a political party and they're not for or against any candidate. Early voting runs from October 20th to November 5th, with election day being on Tuesday, November 8th. Circle that day on your calendar. The deadline to register to vote online at the election office or by mail is October 14th. But you can register in person during early voting. So, um, the rules for this evening. Candidates will have an opportunity to give a two-minute opening introduction as a part of the answer to the first question. So two minutes for the first question. Following that, candidates will have one minute each to answer questions on the topics of housing, transportation, climate change, environmental justice, and equity, all questions that we received in advance. These will be asked in the first half of the event. In the second half, the audience will be able to ask questions. And again, questions are to be directed to the district, not to an individual candidate. Candidates, please keep an eye on the timer. Our timer this evening is Brianna, and she will let you know when you have 30 seconds and when you stop. She doesn't play musical instruments, so we can't, can't play you off, but when you see the pink sheet, it's time. Following the prepared questions, we will address those audience questions. You should have received an index card when you came in. If you don't have one, raise your hand, and one or more can be brought to you. Again, questions must be addressed to the district, not a specific candidate. We may group questions if they're on the same topic, and we may change the order so that they're more randomly asked. Um, again, please raise your hand if you want uh, a card. After the question period, the candidates will have one minute for a closing statement. And we recognize not all candidates may be ready to talk about every issue, so they may want to use their closing statement to kind of catch up on any issue that they missed during the discussion. So thank you for listening to all that. Ready? Good. Uh, so the opening uh, question will go to Rob, and then following questions, we'll start with the next candidate, so everybody gets a chance to go first and go last. So the opening question is, candidates, please talk about the work you do in your professional and advocacy life that propels you to run for office, and how does your area of expertise contribute to benefit all the people in Raleigh? Good evening, thank you for coming and thank you for uh, inviting us here and having us here. Uh, so my name is... Is that better? Yes. There we go. All right. My name is Rob Baumgart. Uh, I have lived in the district or worked in the district for the last 23 years. I came to Raleigh uh, because of NC State and after my sophomore year I started a small business that I ran in the village district for a number of years and shut that down about two years ago. During the time of my business when I had success and found success I started buying rental property in town. Uh, my first ever rental experience was 25 or 26 years old with a fraternity house which was a wild experience uh, but a good one, a good way to, to cut my teeth. Uh, I still live in the district. I live down on Lake Wheeler Road. Uh, I, I still uh, have a, a handful of rental properties in the district as well as in Garner. Um, and that is my full-time profession now is investing in real estate. 
the reason I would like to run for city council, or the reason I feel like I'd be good for city council, is I've had the uh, challenge of being a small business owner since I was a young man and was able to find success, which is difficult for a small business after five years. Most of them fail before you get a five-year mark, and I went nearly 18 years. Uh, so there's resiliency in my background. And then in the world of investing, I have learned how to look forward and think long-term in my investments. And I think that is something that would uh, be very beneficial to city council, to not think just today, but also to look 20 years down the road or 25 years down the road at the choices and the policies that we set, how they would impact our children. Uh, speaking of, I've got two children. They decided not to come tonight after my last speech. Uh, <laughs> They said, Dad, you did great, but can we stay home? So uh, I've lived here 23 years, and I used to do my laundry in this very building before it was trophy. Hey, y'all. Good to be with you tonight. My name is Jane Harrison. I'm running for Raleigh City Council to serve District D. I have a few hats, um, and just bear with me. I teach at NC State. I am faculty in the College of Natural Resources and the Agricultural and Resource Economics Department. So I am an educator. I am an, a, a researcher. I work for North Carolina Sea Grant, also based at NC State. I am not a marine biologist. I do not spend time with dolphins. Rather, this program helps communities across the state with sustainable development issues and the wise use of natural resources. So we work. I understand you know, the small business background that you need to understand what people, what entrepreneurs are looking for in the city. And I have a nature that truly cares about our community. My priorities are community-led development, affordable housing, and environmental stewardship. And in my experience, I'll get to it in a moment, maybe another question. Um, I know that you all have a lot of wisdom to bring to the table, and so I'm just glad that you're here and that we can be part of this conversation tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Todd Kennedy, and I'm running for uh, City Council District D. It's good to be with all of you here uh, tonight. Um, Raleigh is a wonderful city. Uh, I have had the pleasure of living here for over 25 years. <clears throat> and I'm a native of the region. Uh, I've built a career here in public infrastructure and the environment, a family, and I've been dedicated to this community. Uh, that dedication has been demonstrated by over 20 years of public service and leadership in the city with vital community organizations and with city boards and, com uh, and uh, commissions across issues of affordable housing, equity and inclusion, as well as the environment. Uh, it's that depth and breadth of experience that differentiates me most uh, from other candidates in this race. Uh, we are coming out of a difficult period in our city, and we are entering uh, what's really an unprecedented uh, era of growth. Um, I want to serve on council to shape uh, the city's responses to both the challenges and the opportunities that that uh, presents. Uh, I want a future embodied by uh, prosperity, uh, resilience and inclusiveness. We need to work now uh, to move Raleigh forward <clears throat> instead of returning to policies that will stifle this city's growth. That is what this election is about and that's why I'm running to be the independent representative of District D. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Jennifer Truman, and I'm a designer, I'm a working mom, a community leader and advocate, and an optimist. That's why I'm running for Raleigh City Council, because I believe, like these other candidates that were at a critical moment, but I believe optimistically we can grow into the future as a city. We can welcome new neighbors and also support uh, existing residents. I know that because I've city, state, and federal government sources help us build, you know, income levels for uh, housing levels for firefighters, for teachers, for daycare workers. And then what I'm going to say, the three S, the third S is stability in the marketplace. So we have folks that are being forced out of their apartments. We have folks that, um, you know, don't have any protections from their landlords. They are getting evicted and they have nowhere to go. And so with more time, I'd love to talk about those three things and how do we work on them in tandem. Thank you for that question. Um, here we go. Mike. Thank you for that question. Um, our campaign has made affordable housing and a 
housing affordability uh, a, a priority. Um, in terms of um, the current city council, I, I applaud them for some of the efforts that they've uh, pushed forward in the last few years in terms of zoning reforms, in terms of uh, implementing the housing bond, uh, um, and a number of other uh, efforts. Um, and I think um, that that issue, unfortunately, is growing day by day. And so what we need to do is on the market rate housing, we need a more of an abundance of housing uh, of all types, uh, working with our private sector partners. But we also need to invest more in affordable housing, even more than we already have. Um, and I think uh, that includes also, for example, um, doubling down on our uh, support of the Raleigh Area Land Trust. I think that their model uh, has a lot of promise. Um, and uh, I think uh, that, along with sort of other um, uh, uh, additional funding sources, would really help uh, move forward that issue. Thanks. When it comes to affordable housing, um, my answer is simple and two-parted. We need to build more housing, and we need to build more subsidized housing. Um, and that's not just a campaign priority of mine. It's been a priority that I've been advocating for for years. Um, I spent time advocating for zoning reform to allow backyard cottages, to allow duplexes, and other zoning reforms that let more housing be built. I've advocated for apartment buildings to be built with spend that bond money and build the subsidized housing as well. So following up, oops, I'm sorry. Rob, I won't take your time. <laughs> you can start now. So uh, as being a landlord for the last 17 years, especially in the last two years of COVID, two and a half years, I've seen the impact of housing costs affecting my tenants, affecting my neighbors. Uh, two points I want to share that are near and dear to me. One is the uh, accessory dwelling units or granny flats building in our backyard. So if you look at my website, we've got Yimby written across uh, the city skyline. I would like to see uh, our, our citizens put these accessory dwelling units in their backyard. 28% of Americans live alone. So that statistic of the family of four needing to earn 80000 there's a quarter of us that actually live alone without anyone, uh, and they could occupy those accessory dwelling units quite well. Uh, and the other area I'd like to focus on is along the bus rapid transit corridors uh, or areas that we have prescribed that, that should uh, have growth, that we make sure the city council uh, promotes growth and density along those corridors. Thank you all. So, waiting in just a little bit more, um, some federal and state and city subsidies take considerable lengths of time to really get in, into use. So, there are communities like Chapel Hill uh, that are considering fast track processing for affordable development, uh, streamlined permitting so that homes can be built more rapidly if they're going to be affordable. Uh, now, I know there are reasons to and perhaps not to do that, but would you support that approach if you're elected to council? Yes, I think it's clear that we need to bring um, more housing to market, both on the market rate side as well as affordable housing. And so I do think we need to uh, uh, reduce some of the barriers uh, on the market rate side. Um, and I think that can be done through, again, uh, some some uh, process improvements in terms of the city. Um, but I also think on the affordable housing side, one idea uh, in talking with um, um, some folks in affordable housing um, is to um, again, make a fast track for uh, that particular type of housing so that it gets priority in the city, um, they get their approvals faster, and we get that uh, those projects in the ground faster. Uh, yes, I'd support fast track permitting for affordable housing. Um, and generally speaking, any reforms that allow it to be easier to permit housing in the city uh, 
I work for an architecture firm. I permit things every day. Um, I know the folks down in that office um, pretty well. And the real hurdle to quickly processing permits right now is a shortage of staff. People are working long hours um, because they don't necessarily have the funding um, to pay competitively. Some people have left for the private sector in the recession. So on top of streamlining permitting processes, we also need to empower our staff and pay them well so that they, we can keep quality staff to allow us to do that fast tracking of permitting. Uh, of course, I would approve or uh, support fast tracking development uh, and the permit process. Having pulled permits in the past myself, it can be an arduous task. And if we can make it easier for someone who's going to bring more supply to the market, then I'm all for that. Uh, also, if you look at my website, I talk about partner plan promote. And in this answer or question, I think promote is important. Uh, we have a group here, CASA, uh, right down on Jones Street, who provides affordable housing uh, for many people in our area as well as in Durham. Uh, we should promote them. We should work with them and help them who are able to bring on this kind of housing do just that. Um, yes, I'd echo what everyone had to say. I definitely agree that we need to fast track affordable housing permits, but we have to go beyond that and we have to be bold. So one of the, I think, differing factors here in terms of policy, if you want to know how we might differ up on this table, is that when I'm thinking about private units in rezonings in the last five years, 65,000 units, and almost none of them are affordable. And so how are we working with the private sector? How are we working with the development community to ensure that there are some requirements for affordability? And I know that's a hard thing to talk about, um, but it has to be talked about. And it was talked about in the uh, Wake Up Wake County Forum for um, uh, District C, and the question that the moderator asks is, will you go to Jones Street with me? And yes, I will go to Jones Street with you because we have to talk to the state legislature. We have to work with the General Assembly to require, allow requirements for affordable housing when we rezone. We are rezoning all over the city, and if we do not require affordability, guess what? We won't have it. Thank you all. Th this is a question that I think gets a lot of discussion throughout Raleigh. Uh, there are a lot of ranch style homes being torn down and replaced with uh, very large single family homes priced four to five times the original house. Uh, what could or should be done, if anything, by the city to change what's happening and ensure mo more of the existing housing stock, sometimes called naturally uh, occurring, naturally occurring affordable housing, stays affordable. Can can we limit purchases by out-of-state investors? Um. I think that this is a, an issue I have a long track record on when it comes to advocating for what should happen rather than the big McMansions being built after a teardown. Um, I'm the only person at this table that fought for missing middle housing reform before it was cool. Uh, I think that we can't prevent what people want to do with their own property. We can't prevent people from buying. We can't prevent people from selling. Um, that's a freedom that everyone has. But what we can do is make sure that there are options for what can be built back. The reason that we have small homes being replaced by big homes is for a long time, decades and decades, that is all that's been allowed to build. Over the last three to six months, we changed that rule. And as some of you might know, it takes longer than that to build housing. So as we keep those rules in place, we're going to see different types of infill come in, and we're going to see uh, diversity of housing types and housing stocks get built back, and we need to encourage that. Can you repeat the question? Sure. So there are a lot of ranch-style homes being uh, torn down and replaced with very large homes of uh, significantly greater value. What can be done or should be done to alter that pattern? And is there a way of limiting purchases by out-of-state investors? So the second part of the question I'll answer first. I do not think that we should limit the out-of-state buyers from coming in and buying. It's a free market society. If someone comes along and says, hey, I'd like to buy your property for this price, and the seller agrees, well, that's what America's founded on is capitalism. I think we allow that to continue and don't 
mess with that. As far as the teardown homes uh, and the new McMansions, as uh, Jane called them, or Jen called them, uh, they're going to miss out on the ADU in their backyard. They build the entire lot, impervious surfaces ate up, they want to go add a sidewalk and they can't do it because every square inch is used. Uh, as, <laughs> so it's unfortunate for them. Um, but no, I, w I would not promote or, or want to restrict out-of-state buyers. Um, yeah, this is just huge issues to talk through. So when we are tearing down affordable housing, currently affordable housing, I am encouraged by what Wake County is doing. So they do have some funds that they have put in place to help build and keep those, say, apartments in place, to help you know keep those from being turned over. When it comes to a single family dwelling, if someone is leaving because they are pushed out, because prices have rise so much and they cannot pay their taxes anymore, I have talked to folks down off of Mayview, um, who are, I'm sorry, Maywood, Wood, who are saying, I am paying $1,000 a month. Um, I'm sorry, I'm earning $1,000 a month. I'm paying $700 a month in my mortgage. The property tax bill is going up. It's hard for me. So, you know, what are we going to do to secure and stabilize folks who want to stay in the area? I'm with Jen in terms of we need duplexes. We need triplexes. We need options. But we also need to have community conversations and true engagement about what that looks like and who it's being built for. Because when we're rebuilding, we are accelerating rebuilding development of very you know pretty nice homes that many people cannot afford currently so in terms of naturally occurring affordable housing I think we need to put just as much effort into preserving those housing types as we do in building new affordable housing it costs much less to preserve uh, 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 an affordable house rather than uh, build a new one so we should be um, again spending more time on that uh, again and, and I refer back to uh, support for groups like Raleigh Area Land Trust uh, as well as DHIC and CASA are all important groups in that regard uh, in terms of this phenomena of um, sort of investors coming in and, and buying up houses you know we're limited as to what we can do in, in, in regards to that in terms of uh, lack of power from the legislature um, but uh, putting that aside, you know, I think one one thing that could affect it if we is if we just build more market rate housing of all types at all price points, that will put sort of downward pressure on prices, kind of fix that supply and demand sort of equation, and I think that could have a positive impact on this issue. Again, a, a question that is uh, circulating in a lot of areas: What is your plan? for assisting long-term residents of Oberlin Village who are experiencing skyrocketing increases in their property taxes due to gentrification. Do you think that a program providing real estate tax relief for long-term city residents who can no longer afford to pay property taxes is appropriate for the city? I do. Uh, I would. I would be in favor of supporting that legislation or, or policy. Uh, also, by age, if you are retired and no longer working, and you're in your 70s or your 80s, and uh, the tax prices keep going up, well, we should carve you out and say no. You're staying at the rate you were when, you know, you retired, uh, and keep it there. I'm. I'm all for that. Yes, we need property tax relief for folks that are struggling to stay in their homes. Um, I have been a member of the One Wake Coalition um, for years, and this is the group that I think has had the loudest voice on this particular topic. I have been down to talk to the Wake County Commissioners to raise my hand, put my sign in the air, and say, yes, this is something we need. This is another opportunity where we do have to work with our General Assembly. Um, the City Council, we don't always have, you know, all of the uh, powers that we need, but we cannot not we cannot also ignore the problems and what I want to offer is a bold commitment to all of our residents of District D whether you're doing great or whether you're like I don't know if I can stay here any longer how can I maintain you know this wonderful community our social networks are so important our jobs being on the bus line and I commit myself to being in those conversations and to advocating for these kinds of policies so with regard to gentrification, 
with, with regard to gentrification, um, that's a phenomenon that's been going on for some time in Raleigh, and now it's just, you know, sort of in, in overdrive. Um, I think, you know, the role for the city here is, on the one hand, to help prevent displacement um, through, again, preserving naturally occurring affordable housing um, and building new housing. Uh, but on the second hand, I think in the cases where people are being displaced, I think we can give them more support, uh, perhaps requiring more notice, uh, for perhaps resources um, to help them um, uh, uh, find another affordable uh, uh, home. And then in terms, in terms of tax relief, I absolutely support uh, the idea of providing property tax relief for those on fixed incomes and those affected uh, by rising uh, property values such as low to mid, uh, moderate income earners. I agree that we need to expand the options that are available to folks that need tax relief and to do so requires some work beyond what a city councilor or a group of city councilors can do. Um, it requires um, probably a slightly more progressive state legislature so keep that in mind in November as well. Um, I think that the other thing about this issue is that some programs for relief and grants do exist to help people fix up their homes, um, to provide some relief, particularly for elderly residents. Um, and the word about them isn't out as well as it should be. And I talk a lot in every community I go to about how we need to increase our outreach as a city um, into the community centers, into the neighborhoods where people are. We can't expect everyone to come to City Hall. We have to go to them. And I think we really need to improve our communication, particularly when it comes to grants and, and relief programs, because if you you're in a place where you need relief, you're not in a place where you can make it to City Hall. One final question on um, housing, and that is this. The City of Raleigh residents passed an $80 million housing bond recently, which will be spent out over the next five years. There are federal and state funds being invested um, in housing development. Should the city of Raleigh invest more of its own resources than it currently is, beyond what I've mentioned, in affordable housing development? Um, yes, the city needs to invest more. The state needs to invest more. We need federal support. This is an issue at all levels of government, and the private sector has to be with us, and the nonprofits. Um, I see some folks from Habitat here. Thank you. Thank you for your work. And this is just a problem on a scale that, again, we have not seen in this city before. Raleigh is growing because it's a wonderful place, because we all see the value. But at the same time, if we do not work on a scale at a level of uh, bringing these funds um, in, then we are going to push people out. That is what is happening. People are leaving. Um, they have to. So yes, I would support that. And um, I'm hopeful to see what the next council can bring in terms of that commitment. So, so I mentioned earlier, I, I think that the affordable housing sort of deficit is growing and so we absolutely need to invest more resources uh, again I do, I do applaud the current council for what they've done to push this forward um, you know I think partnerships are essential um, in, in that we can't solve the housing crisis alone here in Raleigh we've got to partner with uh, the county uh, neighboring communities uh, we need support from the state and of course as mentioned uh, uh, the federal government so I, I do think partnerships going forward are, is going to be a key part of kind of bringing in additional funding and I also think we need to acknowledge that at some point in time um, uh, in the next several years we're probably going to need another housing bond and so we should start thinking about that obviously we need to use the current uh, um, uh, taxpayer funds uh, wisely um, but uh, I think that's on the horizon. 
so yes, we need to um, spend all the money we have now in the affordable housing bond, but I've, I've said it already tonight and in other places that uh, we need to spend that money as quickly as we can um, so that we can still meet the need by raising more funds either through a bond or through another penny on a tax or something like that that could actually assist. Those are conversations that would have to be had with the community um, after being elected to make sure that um, impacts to those bonds or those taxes wouldn't um, adversely affect the, the thing we're trying to help, right? Whether people can afford to stay in their houses. So this is a complicated problem um, and one that I have already been committed to advocating for for a long time. And I, I think the the underground of what I said earlier, which is that we need to build more housing and allow um, private developers, nonprofit developers to just build more housing is also the systemic way to make sure that this generational cycle of needing homes at a certain time in generations doesn't come back. We got here for a reason and it was bad policy and we need to make sure that we maintain the changes and the progressive good policy that means we won't be here again Thank you. so we were asked if we would uh, or one of the uh, candidates up here said that there will be a new bond coming soon or in a couple years after we spend this bond over the next five years in the last question we discussed elderly people not being able to stay in their home when they're retired because the taxes keep going up. So I would I would exercise caution and be very thoughtful over saying, hey, we need to do another new bond. Uh, one idea that was not presented up here on the board right now is the city has a number of vacant lots. We can release those lots to partners or private developers and, and public-private partnership and build more housing on existing land that the city's not doing anything with currently uh, as well. So uh, another topic that comes up in places like Trophy Brewing, what do you think about the influence of big real estate developers on city council? Uh, do you think they should be limited in their donations to candidates? Todd? <coughs> Todd? And, and are you asking if this, the city should play place limits on that? Well, let me rephrase okay. it a little bit. Just what, what do you think about the influence of big real estate developers on city council? Is their influence disproportionate? <laughs> well, uh, they certainly have influence, um, as do many special interests across the city. Um, I don't believe that the city has the power, nor nor, nor should it restrict, um, you know, other than the current sort of campaign finance laws, what those developers can contribute uh, to to candidates. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's the voters who will hold that candidate uh, uh, accountable in terms of what that person has done and the votes that they've made, um, whether they're influenced unduly by the developer or not. Um, I think that this is a question we hear frequently because people don't understand how the process works for getting buildings built. Um, I think that um, developer is it become a bad word when in reality most of those people are neighbors. They live in our district, they work in our district, they employ people in our district. They just happen to build buildings, they happen to ask to build buildings. Um, and I'll add that the limit for campaign um, contributions for local elections is $5,600. Um, they must come from individuals and not businesses. Uh, I didn't know that until I ran for council, so I'm saying it out loud because I don't know if everyone knows that. Um, and I pride myself on being an honest and transparent person. You can see everyone who's donated to me. Some of them build buildings. Some of them live in them. Um, but I don't have an ethic or a moral that I would compromise for $5,000. People who donate to the campaign do so because they believe in our decision-making abilities, not because they expect something back from it. I'm going to second that comment. I would not sell myself for $5,600. Uh, so, no, I would, I would not do that either. Uh, Let's not interject. <laughs> thank you. Um, no, I, I believe this falls on the state. The State Board of Elections sets these rules. Uh, the City Council would not set these rules. And as Todd said, we as the voters get to uh, see 
who's donating what money to what candidate, uh, and we get to see how they vote. And so if you don't like the way, one of the four of us is going to represent you guys, right, for the next two years. So if you feel that we're being influenced by spe special interest or unduly representing one group over another, you can vote us out two years later. Uh, but no, I don't think it's the city's job to say you cannot uh, receive donations above a certain amount. That's the State Board of Elections. Um, maybe I'm the lone voice in this, but I'm pretty sure money does take over politics. I've seen it on all levels, federal, state, local. Um, we have to watch out for those kinds of things. I do not take donations from large-scale developers. I do think there is a difference between small-scale and large-scale and how much influence some of these folks have. I want folks to be able to build in this city, too, but I don't want it to be a monopoly. So downtown south, that was approved in 2019, December 2019. It it was fast-tracked, unanimous opposition from the Planning Commission, 14,000 new units in District D, new housing units. Are they affordable? Well, after the 1,000th one is built, we are going to have 80% AMI affordability for five years. Um, and so, I don't know, what's this going to look like? How is it going to impact our neighbors? I'm excited to have a new restaurant to go to. I like eating well. Like I said, I like oysters. I do that. Um, but if that is going to cause displacement and we are not thinking about the people that it impacts, then to me that is undue influence. Thank you. So, um, let's change gears a little bit and uh, move to um, city staffing. What are your plans to tackle the public safety staffing issues in the Raleigh Police Department, the Fire Department, and emergency communications? Jennifer, you start. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think uh, all city departments, not just those in public safety, uh, have staffing problems. I work for the city at the city pools for over a decade, and um, this summer we had trouble opening them because we didn't have enough lifeguards. Uh, I've said before, you know, your lifeguards from this summer are your firefighters and your police officers for five or ten years from now. We've got to solve it at all levels um, for the people that pick up our, our leaves and our solid waste, for the people that are on the police department and the fire department. We have to look whole holistically across the city at full-time and part-time employees. We've never really done a part-time employee study to understand what kind of benefits um, and pay they get. Um, but to directly answer the question, I think that the firefighters and the police officers got some money in a raise this year. It's not as much as they wanted. There are other voices in the community that also want to have a say in how we fund the police. And I come right down the middle to say that we need to actually take the time to have those hard conversations. We need to understand that we need good, good pay for good officers in our police force and good firefighters. Um, but we also need to talk about the real risks that occur in some parts of our community. Thank you. So one word comes to mind uh, for me when it comes to our city employees, uh, specifically the firemen, uh, respect. We need to respect those employees and respect what they do for us and respect how they keep us safe or uh, you know keep our city's uh, streets clean and provide us all the services we have in this wonderful city. Uh, to expand upon how we could increase the number of employees coming through, Garner High School has a program for uh, public safety. So a graduating senior can take a public safety course and become EMT certified while they're in high school. We can implement that here in, in Raleigh uh, and also lower the age that you can start working for the fire department from 19 to 18 and let those young men and women when they graduate high school uh, go right into the workforce. Um, recruitment, retainment of our employees is critical. Ultimately, on city council, city councilors don't do the hard work. We don't do any of the everyday stuff that makes the city run. It is our sanitation workers, it's our 911 responders, it's our firefighters, and we are losing folks left and right. I work in state government. I know that it's tough keeping people on right now. Um, we have to be competitive. We have to consider what inflation is doing to affordability for these folks. Um, um, I, you know, spent four years at NC State advocating for paid parental leave. This is a benefit that we did not have as university employees. This is an example of something that makes it worth 
you know, working in the public sector. I've worked in the public sector my entire life. I know, you know, the pay is not always that great, but we're there for the stability. We're there for the benefits. And so I worked with the Council on the Status of Women for four years to advocate for a paid parental leave policy that's for the birth or adoption of your child for eight weeks. And now it is in place as of 2019 for 30,000 UNC employees. So I want to focus on the public safety uh, piece of that question, and especially the police. Uh, I can't think of a more essential public service that our city government provides. Uh, that's public safety. Um, we have a department, police department, in the city right now that's about 85, 80 percent of a full force, and I think that is just unacceptable. Um, the city council did uh, provide some additional funding to address some pay issues in this last budget. I would have gone further. Uh, we need to increase pay. We need to fill those vacancies. We need to ad address salary compression, uh, and that's something that uh, is a is a, is, a, is absolutely a priority for me. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about transit. Um, what would you propose to do to increase public transportation infrastructure, uh, whether light rail or bus service? Uh, would you continue to support and advance the 10-year bike rally plan that was approved in 2016 for bike accessibility? And, and in general, do you have any thoughts on reducing carbon emissions to address the climate issue specifically? So there's a number of different ways you can take this question. Um, the planning portion of it. So the people that do the planning and like Campo, uh, Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, who've put the thought into this, or Go Triangle, who've put the thought into commuter rail, those are professionals, engineers, wonderful people who know what they're doing. So as a city council person, we should follow their guidance and work to see it to reality. As far as the commuter rail, Raleigh is going to encompass about 20% of the actual linear length of the commuter rail if it goes from Clayton over to Durham. Uh, it's not our decision alone. It is Clayton's, Garner's, Carey's, and we need to partner with those municipalities and the university. I believe there's three universities along that rail. Uh, and then the final part would be looking at partnering with uh, Uber or Lyft for a final mile. If you haven't looked into that before, it's a really cool concept. You get off the bus at the bus station, and you can use city tokens to get on an Uber. Um, all of the above, we need everything to have other transit options. I bicycle to work. I'm a bicycle commuter. I used to take the 11L bus when I was not close enough in District D to bike. Um, the service frequency has got to be fixed as soon as possible. You know, my bus route, it came every hour. If I missed it, well, I'm waiting another hour. I have a member on my campaign team, when she comes 10 miles from north to south Raleigh to knock doors with me, it takes her an hour and a half on the bus. It's crazy. And so we have a lot of investments in the mix that I'm really excited about. And I have a feeling we all have some agreement there. But we also have to do everything we can to improve service today. So we have just lost frequency of service on at least 12 routes across the city. It affects the method route in District D as well as the Carolina Connector. Um, they have gone down to an hour each every hour. And so we have got to work again on that recruitment and retention piece of our staff, our bus drivers. Are they getting what they want? Are we, you know, training them as we need? And, uh, yeah, that's, I'll turn it to Todd. So, um, Raleigh's future needs to be a multimodal future. And we're making plans for that today. But what I'd like to propose is a comprehensive mobility plan uh, with a strong community engagement component that looks at the entire city and all of the different modes of transportation that we have now and then uh, assess what the current state is and what the connectivity is so for example if someone wants to take a bike from one spot to another say from their home to their job um, they can do that in some parts of the city and some they cannot and so that would be part of a sort of a comprehensive strategy and sort of funding model it would it would, it would include uh, and sort of incorporate the the, the, the the bike rally plan that you mentioned here um, and I think that's that's part of the solution for for getting to where we want to go and that's going to tie in 
transit um, roads. We, you know, you know, we're still uh, dominated by cars, so we're going to have to still maintain those roads and build more bike lanes, sidewalks, um, and um, uh, I think that's uh, a plan we need to take. Uh, this is a, a good question and an important one for our city. It's one of my priorities for a reason. Uh, I'm a bus rider, a bike rider, and a walker. Means of getting around the district. that the DOT refused to put sidewalks on and, and do that regularly and to this day. Um, I think that we have two parts of a plan for transit. One is a big uh, get people to vote for the Lake Transit plan and um, it's continuing to being updated right We need to keep doing those things while we get back to basics. Our work plan for the Raleigh Transit Authority, um, several of us, including myself, spearheaded getting maps back on the bus shelters, branding on the signs, and talking about those sidewalk gaps and benches over the next year. So we have the basics. And if you want to talk about bus operators, that's way more than a minute, but I'm happy to fill you in. Thank you. So uh, let's talk trash. So <laughs> how do you propose we divert trash from public spaces, events, and the new social district. Should Raleigh be moving from single garbage cans to dual or triple stream waste stations? And this I found out is where you have waste and then paper and then recyclables in uh, separate bins. like some other municipalities have done to reduce adding to landfills. Um, yeah, I love the idea asking them to. It seems easy at times, but you'd, you know, you'd wonder. I would also advocate for composting service um, through the city. Um, I think that would be so wonderful. We have so much waste, unfortunately, that comes. And so all of these pieces are critical, and I'm going to turn it to Todd. Thank you. Um, in terms of recycling, I think you know we, we, we made a movement some time ago to have this sort of mixed um, uh, sort of recycling program where you know you put everything in the bin, and it's getting gotten really complicated for people because some things are recyclable and some aren't, even if they have the little recyclable uh, uh, sort of symbol on it. And also, what's occurred is a lot of those bins then become sort of polluted with things that aren't recyclable, and it's so, at some percentage then uh, of sort of a a, 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 a polluted sort of uh, uh, you know pile of recyclables uh, that would, would directly go to the landfill. So you know I would propose maybe looking at some more separate bins and also limiting simplifying recycling and limiting it, limiting it to the most essential sort of items that you know we think are best um, recyclable. Um, you know certain types of plastics, uh, uh, aluminum cans, uh, for example, would be uh, the priority just in terms of um, what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think we're all um, environmentalists at this table, and so we know how important recycling and, and other means of diverting waste, like reducing how much we use and composting are. Um, but I think this is one of those issues we need to trust our solid waste services employees on. Um, we have automatic trucks that reduce labor and reduce costs to collect our single stream recycling um, that we've invested in. So we need to really take a look at what that what um, impact changes would make to that. But there are other programs like composting. I was one of the original Compost Now customers, um, and my chickens helped me 
compost now, um, actually in my own backyard. And I think that um, the other, like another thing that um, Councilor Crowder tried a couple years ago, which was a pilot program we could bring back, is um, cloth recycling. So actually, a, quite a bit of our landfill waste was going to fabrics and cloth. Uh, so I think we really just need to maybe take another look at that as we come out of the survival mode we've been in the pandemic and think about what options for moving forward there might be. So I believe in your question, you commented on Glenwood South and, and uh, having trash cans out there. Uh, there is uh, one of our sponsors tonight is Live It Up Hillsborough Street. Devin's back here in the back corner. So one of the Live It Up Hillsborough Street's primary responsibilities of their business improvement, di business improvement district is to keep the street clean. Uh, so if you've been along Hillsborough Street in the last 15 years versus when I was in school 25 years ago, it is a far cleaner street today. So in, to answer part of that question about Glenwood South or downtown Raleigh alone, uh, that business improvement district, we can continue to support those organizations from the city's uh, budget and keep those areas clean. As far as recycling is concerned, I would love to have recycling picked up weekly at my house. Uh, and if that was an option to pay for it, I would pay for it as a citizen if it was an extra fee to do so. Because I actually put more of my recycling bin than I do my trash bin. Question on, on land use. Uh, District D has a large number of institutions, including RECs and state-owned property. How will you handle growth and affordability in a district that has so much land being out of reach? Todd. So I think back to partnerships here um, there may be opportunities to par partner with some of these large landowners um, you know we all live in the same community we all have the same goals um, so I think that's a conversation worth having um, you know if, if um, you know it doesn't result uh, or bear any fruit then you know um, that 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 land uh, is it's just not available but that would be the first thing I would want to do is to see if there's opportunity for, for, for partnerships I think again that's one of the key to the future in terms of uh, housing affordability and affordable housing. I, I agree that uh, in District G where we have such a, a large amount of property owned by the state and by, by large landowners that the, the key is partnership or relationships, um, but it's also optimism and proactively seeking those conversations. Um, for example, um, on Lake Wheeler Road as the Southwest Community Engagement Forum, we organized along with the state, private developers, some of the city employees working on the Dix Edge study and the Dix Conservancy, um, a meeting where we talked about all of the different projects that were happening on the street. We did that as community members because we felt the need to proactively talk about the issues that were facing that part of the district, even with uh, folks from the State Farmers Market and Dix Park that are large properties at the table, because sometimes the small details fall out in those large plans and it takes neighbors to remind you of them um, and as a counselor I, I think proactivity and being optimistic and and welcoming all of those meetings welcoming all those partners to the table is how we're going to be able to navigate getting the most out of those deals in the future So I just mentioned uh, Live It Up Hillsborough Street, a business improvement district. Blue Ridge Corridor Alliance, I don't believe, have the right to bill a millage rate yet, which is the taxable rate. So along the Blue Ridge Corridor, the state of North Carolina owns a lion's share of the land below Rex Hospital uh, across the, uh, the North Carolina Museum of Art. That was supposed to have been turned over to private development through Project Phoenix, uh, I believe, five, six years ago, and then it fell apart when uh, McCrory lost, and uh, that was, was taken away. So when you're voting this uh, November 8th, think about that as well. We did have a plan in place to release a lot of that land from the state back to private development. Had that happened, the Blue Ridge Corridor Alliance would have been uh, an already operating business improvement district with clean and safe street programs like we just mentioned about the trash. Uh, and on my website, I talk about partner plan promote. We do need to partner with our neighboring cities as well. Garner is a stone's throw. Some people in Garner live closer than people in North Raleigh to our core. Uh, so partnering with Garner or partnering with Carrie uh, would help us as well. 
Yeah, I want to echo um, just what I'm hearing from Rob about the Blue Ridge Corridor Alliance, the role that they play in that area. Um, you know, uh, we have a lot of public lands too that we do want to preserve. So, you know, Dix Park, for example, is just an amazing treasure, an amazing gem of, you know, relatively undeveloped space. I mean, most cities don't have that kind of space. And I think that is what draws some folks to District D is having that space. But where it makes sense, and we can do mixed use developments where we can have walkability from businesses to a Departments to um, you know our workplaces those are the areas where I'd like to see growth and I restarted the West Raleigh uh, CAC last year because I knew that we needed to have these kinds of community conversations about what's coming and so each month we meet we hear from city staff we talk to folks on the Blue Ridge Corridor Alliance we find out oh, okay you're fixing up this bridge you know these are the opportunities for bikeability um, um, what's coming down the pike and so I think that's very important staying in relationship with one another so now we're going to turn to uh, questions from the audience and if you haven't had a chance to uh, write one down please feel free we can do our best to try and get some of these topics uh, addressed um, this one I think is is very topical how do you feel about and, and would you reinstate CACs, citizen action committees, Advi citizen advisory committees? I got that right. Yeah, citizen advisory committees. So when the city council disbanded uh, CACs, uh, I think it was the way they did that that really created a lot of sort of discord and divisiveness. Um, I think a lot of us agreed that there was some improvements that needed to be made to the system. Um, and uh, in, instead of pursuing those, um, we just completely stopped funding them and coordinating with them officially as much. Um, so I think that was a mistake. Um, and um, I would consider a potential uh, CAC 2.0 uh, as part of uh, um, a comprehensive community engagement plan, uh, you know, in, involving some of the things we're doing now. But it would have to address the serious issues uh, that we had with the way the previous ones were uh, sort of constructed, uh, 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 the, the power they had, if, if you will, in terms of the votes on the rezoning and so forth, and also, you know, address the issue of representation uh, is the CAC uh, truly representative of the people uh, uh, that sort of that jurisdiction uh, covers I think this is the big question uh, everyone asks it at every meeting um, and I'll be honest no I don't think CACs need to come back as they were I served as the secretary for the Southwest CAC for years I was the youngest person in the room every meeting unless I brought my kids um, and I'm the average age of many people that live in our district. Um, they didn't represent all of Raleigh, um, and nothing is ever perfect at doing that, um, but as neighborhood groups, they can still exist. As a counselor, I'll still meet with any neighborhood group, no matter what they're called, um, but I think as a city, we have the obligation to do better to reach people um, directly. We can do that online. We can do that by having staff that cover all of the city department's issues at our community centers. We have dozen community centers in our district and parks. We could have regularly scheduled meetings that are led by staff about these issues from these departments um, and and actually have interface with people directly and not through um, a bit of a, a shortcut that CACs provided that wasn't truly representative. Uh, I had the pleasure of having coffee with Will Allen uh, in early August after I announced that I was running for council. And he and I had a, uh, a discussion about the CACs, and he voiced his opinion that he was not in favor of the way they, they were disbanded, not in favor of the way they were run the last couple of years. And the story he shared was there was a vote. Uh, I believe it was the Hillsborough Wade CAC. And the vote ended up being 6-2. to two. And the mayor called and said, hey, what was the vote? And he said 6-2. to two. And she said, which way? I said, does it matter? It was 6-2. to two. 
stating to the point that they're not representative of all citizens of Raleigh. We do have exchange.raleighnc.gov as a online forum now. Uh, it is 2022. Most of us are able to get online and read and type and, and you know submit comments and review comments from others. And I think we continue to promote that exchange uh, for ideas and encourage uh, neighbors to get on it and, and be involved. If elected to council, I will work to reestablish the CACs. I believe we need community forums to talk we're about not gonna issues. Interject um, oh no. support I'm, for opposition. Thanks. I'm glad that we're all here today. I'm glad that I'm hearing from Todd, from Jen, from Rob, because they have ideas I haven't thought of. I'm hoping that I'm bringing something to the table they. CAC last year, guess what? We lowered our age in terms of leadership by a generation. <laughs> we went down in years by 25, I'd say, on average. We brought on new chairs, new secretaries, new treasurers, folks who are saying, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready to get in the mix. And I do believe we need these spaces to bring on the next generation of leadership. And it's what this community looks like. So a question on the Community Engagement Board. How will you support the Community Engagement Board? And do you have a plan for engaging the Raleigh community that includes um, black and brown citizens who aren't represented here tonight? First, I'll say I think that there are a couple of uh, members of the Community Engagement Board in the room, so thank you for volunteering for that tough task. Um, and uh, also there are some members of our black and brown community in the room, so thank you for being here. Um, we need to do a better job of outreach as a city and also as deep engagement where we have a two-way communication. Um, as a designer, that's what I do every day is talk to people about what the potential challenges are, what the assets they bring to the table are, and how we can mix those up and create a solution together. Um, so I think that the Community Engagement Board is starting to address a lot of those issues, but they've just barely begun their work. And we need to give them a way uh, and a space and a time to do that and, and talk about what a 2022 version of community engagement might look like that deeply engages some of the members of our community that have not been included in the past. Seemed like there was two questions to that. So the first one, the Community Engagement Board, uh, if you are impacted by development, you get a letter in the mail. And you get a letter from the city of Raleigh that shows you a nice map that highlights the property getting renovated next to you and a description of what they're asking for. Why can't that be converted to email? Or why can't that be converted to a text message? We are living in 2022. We have plenty of smart people in our, our uh, city that work for us. And uh, the citizens that live here in District D specifically are very well educated. So bringing that messaging to electronic uh, means would be fantastic. Um, as far as the black and the brown community, I don't uh, see them as any different than a citizen here in Raleigh. Um, I had the opportunity to rent a building to a group called SHIP Community. given to them from uh, the Food Bank of North Carolina and some other partners, and then they give those to local churches. They also have a small grocery store, uh, but they're, they're now in District D, and my time is up. I'm excited about the Community Engagement Board and what they can do. I know there are a few members here that represent that group, and thank you for your service. Um, you know, one of the reasons I think that CAC struggled is they didn't have a lot of structural support. They didn't have, um, you know, a department that was providing leadership training, professional development. Um, there was very few, you know, financial resources put into it. So I'm excited to see what, you know, putting a little money behind it, maybe 
rehiring the community ambassadors throughout the city, what that can do to bring new voices to the table, and to have these community groups that are run by the community. And so going back again to the CACs and just representation, they did look different across the city. Depending on what neighborhood you were in, they were run by different folks. And so I just, I just have to push back on that. But I appreciate the question, and I'm excited to see what we can do on all levels for community engagement. Well, this is something that Jane and I can agree on. I am excited about this new uh, community engagement board. Uh, as someone who has served on a number of city boards and commissions, uh, again, I applaud their service um, uh, and look forward to uh, their additional recommendations for how to improve community engagement in the city. Uh, I am also uh, very happy to uh, see the new digital connectors program being rolled out. Uh, and I think there's a lot of exciting things sort of coming out of that office and out of that board. Um, in terms of um, uh, underserved and marginalized communities, I would say that we absolutely uh, need to uh, seek out and amplify their voices. Um, we need to find um, new and unique ways to reach out to them. Sometimes uh, that may be actually physically getting to them. And I understand that this new experiment with the community engagement bus may be helpful in that regard. I look forward to seeing how that works. Um, but we need to find a number of different methods that are convenient um, and um, that are accessible um, as many as possible so that uh, not only marginalized uh, and uh, underserved populations can have access to certain Services and programs and engage but, uh, for all of us really uh, to be able to engage effectively thank okay. you thank you so if you're elected what would you do to work harder negotiating with developers who need rezoning to make sure that they include thousands of uh, affordable housing units uh, with good long 30-year affordability in their developments and how would you ensure that they are uh, held to that challenge uh, and that they comply with city requirements. So I think the missing middle 2.0 text and the desire to bring more duplexes and triplexes into uh, the city is, is a good start. So we need to give that time to see if that can work. Uh, earlier I mentioned the accessory dwelling units and, and that a quarter of our population lives alone. So I'd like to see that promoted and let, let that actually work. Uh, as far as working with the developers, uh, if we can fast track their development process and make it simpler for them, uh, they will be more inclined to build affordable housing. If we make that little caveat say hey you can build faster if you build affordable housing uh, we can do that and we should do that I do appreciate the incentives that are put in place for affordable housing on uh, our transit corridors so you have to also put in 20% affordable housing um, and so that's an incentive based program to get our developers to you know kind of help provide that that's one way to do it when it comes to rezonings and you know what we can do as a city council again we have to work at you know multiple levels of government here so we have to talk to our general assembly about what can be required and we have to ask for it you know if there's a rezoning coming that goes against our comprehensive plan um, where there is significant environmental implications where the community benefits are not clear you know these are entitlements so when we are up zoning properties we are essentially providing you know a lot of profit to somebody hopefully it's a lot of housing and a lot of community benefits to us at the same time and those are the questions I'm going to be asking So, um, at the present time, um, there are some legal restrictions for us to require um, affordable housing as part of a rezoning development proposal. Uh, all powers that the city has comes down from the state government, um, and the guidance that I've heard and read says at the moment we cannot require that. However, uh, if you've noticed, uh, as part of the conditions of a number of larger developments, um, developers have offered up affordable housing as sort of part of the conditions to get their rezoning. Um, so uh, they. Um, <clears throat> 
And so I think we need to continue to work with developers because they're, because they're members of the community and partners with us in this on that in that regard. I do think we should leverage these density of bonuses in uh, the uh, tr uh, transit corridors. I think that's going to be imp uh, an important tool going forward. Um, one of the concerns I have though, about some of the affordable housing commitments is that they're typically for a very short time period, uh, two, 10 years for example, um, that's going to come and go in no time and then what, what are we left with? And then one more comment, one more idea um, is perhaps an additional affordable housing to sort of advance uh, this issue in the community. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think as the other candidates have spoken, we have multiple levers where we can touch on how to create affordable housing. Um, out of rezoning is only one of them, and it's and it's not the most important one. Um, but since you asked about it, I will say that um, I'm the. I'm the only one with a record for asking for those things from developers. I'm the only one who stood there and stood in front of community members and had those conversations already. Um, we can ask for things, but we also have to listen to what the needs for them being built are. Um, one of the reasons why we're limited in our terms on affordable housing is that's what the grants are. So we've got to build up alternative means of funding as a city or a state, as well as those partnerships in order to get more permanent housing built. We can do that on our own land. And I'll also say that I'm glad everyone is in support of the transit overlay districts that I was also the only person to stand in support of that's at this table. Um, we need to build more housing. If we build more housing, all housing will be more affordable. And we can't hold up um, rezonings or projects to make them perfect. We've got to build the housing that comes to the table. So what, what are your thoughts about the preservation of the character of existing Raleigh neighborhoods? And what, do you have any thoughts about preserving Raleigh landmarks that may currently be uh, demolished in redevelopment? Yeah, I think we have to preserve what makes us special, what makes Raleigh unique. Um, there are so many really unique places in District D. Um, I was just um, getting my hair cut at the Junction Salon. Um, that's the depot building. Um, there are questions about how that property might be redeveloped. Um, I was talking to the folks that work there, and they're telling me, you know, because of this planned, you know, rezoning potential, you know, destruction of that building, they're already looking for a new home. So they're thinking, we, we just might have to leave. We can't even, you know, worry about these um, kind of challenges to the space. And so I think if the next council can show that they have a commitment to these special places, um, hopefully that will give our businesses some sense of, yes, you know, I, I'm going to be able to maintain, you know, this, this place. And our communities are going to feel like, yeah, this is my neighborhood too. This is this is what I want it to be. Um, so devil's in the details. I know it's tough, um, but that is something I am committed to. So last evening, I was uh, at the Players Retreat, uh, a rally institution. Um, I want that place preserved. Um, I don't want to see it uh, torn up and turned into something else. Uh, I've been in rally essentially, you know, going on you know three decades now, and. It's just now at a sort of more rapid pace. Um, I, th I think we do need to uh, preserve the essential character, for example, of our neighborhoods. Um, but I th that's also subjective. Um, I think there needs to be a balance between um, preserving the essential character and also uh, doing infill, doing middle mill housing, um, and that type of thing. Uh, I think ultimately the balance is what we're seeking. We're going through a rough spot right now because we're implementing this new policy. Um, but uh, I think over time we'll we'll figure out it. We'll, we'll, we will figure it out. Uh, I think. First, I'll say that I um, design this kind of project for a living. I go into old buildings and make them cool again. Uh, they're complicated projects, and, and they don't always work um, without the money behind it, without the incentive behind it, without the grants behind it. There are things we could do as a city to encourage um, fixing that gap. 
Um, so it's not just necessarily the goodwill of, of people like the people that redid this building where they put in some extra money that they, that, that will allow them to save the building. Because I've, I've had projects fall apart because the extra time it would take to review it um, made it not affordable. The bank wouldn't loan them the money, which meant that the building is gone now. Um, and that hurts everyone. Uh, we need to preserve some of our, our unique character. and we, But we also have to realize that we can't stop change. Um, we can't use preserving character as an excuse or a scapegoat when we mean other things, which I've heard many times speaking in front of council. Um, and we need to to think about each project individually. I was really glad to see Seaboard the Station um, come with a commitment to preserve the building or not get their additional entitlement. We have levers we can push, and, and we would be able to use that on council, and I would be willing Thank to you. use that. I have some personal experience with uh, historic preservation. I lived in Boylan Heights for a number of years. Uh, one of my old tenants is in the audience tonight, uh, and I had the joy of being able to renovate those homes. Uh, five years ago, I was given the opportunity to sell a property to NC State University, uh, and they asked me to knock it down. And they said, we're going to pay you to knock this house down. Uh, the inner child of me was like, oh, I get to ride an excavator. This is going to be awesome. Uh, but then I thought, you know, I love this property. This is a beautiful home, beautiful would work. You, you're not going to find this again. You're not going to build this new. And I asked university, may I go ahead and move it? And they said, sure, you can move it. And I did. Uh, and th that should be promoted. And that, like the, the project along, uh, or just below William Peace University, where we moved all those homes to 15 years ago. Uh, what a wonderful experience to be able to drive down that road and see those antebellum homes along that, that stretch of Victorian homes. Um, I think the city should work to preserve our character, uh, and we should make that part of development development uh, process. Do you have any creative ideas for improving sustainability in the city and protecting our air, our water, our ground? And the example given was uh, solar power sourced energy for city buildings. So any creative thoughts? So um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Climate Action Plan for the City of Raleigh. Um, I was a member of the Environmental Advisory Board who worked on early sort of components of that, and I'm really proud that uh, the city has adopted that plan, and now we need to move forward and aggressively implement that. But my new idea is that I think that we need to sort of um, have an adjunct to that, if you will, and um, um, create, create a program I'm going to call Resilient Raleigh. Uh, uh, and working with the sustainability department. Um, and this would create essentially a, a resilience plan that covers and spans environmental issues, social issues, uh, culture, and um, you know economic issues. Um, and I think that that's what our city needs. Uh, we learned through the pandemic that being resilient <laughs> is uh, an important characteristic of a city, and we need to work to make the city more resilient for everyone. Uh, certainly the city has a climate action plan and there are a lot of good initiatives under that plan for solar power um, uh, and you can get money for that now. The program has started for um, uh, other aspects of sustainability that I'm sure folks will touch on but there's one thing missing um, from that plan. It's like a sub point of a sub point of a sub point and that's urban agriculture and local food systems. Um, I spent six the entrepreneurial nonprofit and and real love that people give to our city through food, giving away food, growing food, um, and and supporting the environment with sustainable and permaculture methods of doing so. Um, um, last year, over 30 organizations and myself petitioned the city council to make a comprehensive food policy plan that would address those issues. Um, and unfortunately, nothing has occurred yet. There's still ARPA funding that could be spent on that. And we absolutely should focus on food as a core part of resiliency because it touches not just sustainability, but also the basic needs that our residents have. Thank you. Whoever asked this question, thank you. It's a fun one. Uh, so you asked for creative ideas. Uh, back I read an article on WRL that talked about the city of Paris, France, using the, the Seine River for geothermal heating and cooling. 
What an amazing concept. They have 700 buildings in the city of Paris that are heated and cooled by that river. So if you want to talk about doing something good for the environment and not burning coal or uh, using a power plant to, to run our HVAC systems, look to Paris. What a wonderful thing that they did. Uh, I use geothermal in my home that I'm renovating now, uh, and I'm excited for the efficiency of it uh, and the reduced cost of, of operating and running that. We do have a number of creeks running through our city. Uh, one, they need to be daylighted so we can enjoy them. Uh, but two, why couldn't we use them to, to do some geothermal HVAC in our buildings? Thanks. Um, I really want to see us encourage nature-based solutions. So what do we learn from nature? Um, you know, what trees do, what our soil does, you know, when it rains, they are taking, you know, whatever um, pollutants are out there and they're having to, to deal with those. If we do not have enough, um, you know, natural spaces, if we have too much impervious surface, then we are going to see pollutants in our waterways. Um, we have flooding issues in our community. We have, you know, urban heat islands that we need to, to work on. And so I think in terms of being innovative, we can look at models from other places. Wilmington has a tree preservation ordinance for significant specimens. So when you do a you know development project, redevelopment, there are trees of a certain size. Perhaps you know on the coast it's live oaks. I you know here it might be um, a willow oak. And if they are of a certain size, then maybe we wouldn't cut them down in a particular area. I know that's a concern as we redevelop. How do we preserve our tree canopy? Um, and then when it comes to stormwater runoff. Um, it's a major issue when it comes to the flooding and folks that are getting flooded out at times and that's something that we have to really work on our stormwater infrastructure and get to the next generation of what it's going to look like. Thank you. Well, we're going to circle back to housing again and the question is the last affordable housing bond was for $80 million. The parks bond was for $275 million. If you support another housing bond, would you support one of a significantly greater size? And what do you think about comparing those two different amounts from the last bond referenda? I think that goes to. Um. I think I've already said that I would support another housing bond. I think um, it's a few years out, so we'll have to see what it should be. But certainly, I think that the, the one we had could have been bigger, and it's likely that we'll need a bigger one um, with rising construction costs. And if we aren't able to, to see uh, see a significant supply increase, though I think we will from the, the changes that we've made. Um, and I will say that I support the parks bond. Um, I don't think it's a fair comparison to compare the two amounts of money um, because the breadth of the parks bond includes over 20 projects in every district of the city, particularly in South Raleigh and Southwest Raleigh and District D and Southeast Raleigh and District C, in parks that have been traditionally underfunded. Um, in our own district, it includes improvements to Methay Community Center. It includes improvements, a very small amount for Dix Park to help fund that, but improvements to Lake Wheeler Road so that people can actually get downtown from our part of town and to the park uh, from south of it. Uh, there are a lot of equity issues that are addressed within the parks bond, and, and we all know from how much time we've spent outside over the last few years how healing uh, that can be. It's, it's equally you. important as housing. Thank you. So I would agree, I don't think it's fair to compare the parks bond to the housing bond, but the question was, would you support a larger housing bond going forward? And I would like to, to be thoughtful about that before saying here in 2022 that yes, we should have another housing bond. No, let's see what our density uh, changes that we've made in the transit overlaid district or the ability for ADUs to be built or the missing middle text. Let's see if we can't naturally solve this housing crisis by increasing the supply. Uh, the demand is going to continue to be there because Raleigh is a wonderful place to live and uh, I don't think we will have people decide to leave here um, anytime soon. So I'm going to I'm gonna withdraw saying yes, I would support another housing bond or not until we get to that time and we have real data for what the changes we have now uh, are, have made. I support parks and people. So I am supporting the parks bond because it does bring a lot of benefits to our district. Dix Park, Devereux Meadows, 
um, Lake Wheeler, our Greenway system, Method Park. These are investments that if we hold off, they will only get pricier with time. So we have to make those infrastructure investments now. Now I say that I am supporting the parks bond as an I will vote for it. But that is up to every individual in this city to see that value. And as I've said earlier, there are folks who are going to find that cost challenging. And so that's that's real. Um, in terms of the difference in, in amounts of investment, you know, from affordable housing to parks, I think they should be at least comparable. We have to put more money into affordable housing. Now again, where does it come from? Does it come from the city? Does it come from partnerships with developers offering affordable housing in conditions and rezonings? Yeah, that's on the table. Um, but I do think we have to support both of those issues. Uh, there we go again, Jane. Uh, we agree. I support the parks bond. I, I think a comparison between the affordable housing bond and the parks bond is a bit is a bit strained. Um, these are different parts of pots of money used in different ways. Uh, the affordable housing bond helps us leverage other funding, and so that's one key difference. Uh, I, I think also, um, being a large city like Raleigh, we, we have to do lots of, we have to have lots of priorities and do lots of things uh, together at the same time. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, an amount for a future uh, affordable housing bond, I obviously did mention earlier that I think at some point we, we, we will need one. Uh, I don't have a position on what that amount will be. I think it's too, uh, it's too soon to say. Um, and I'll mention another couple of things about the parks bond. Um, Two reasons I am supporting it is one, it has some essential equity uh, uh, components uh, for parts of our city. And so that's something to keep in mind uh, and just kind of ties into the larger issue there. And finally, it will, it will provide additional investment for DICS, which will be an economic engine for the district and the city, and over the long term may actually help us uh, provide additional funding for uh, our affordable housing issue. Thank you. One final question, and then we'll move to uh, closing statements. Am I okay? Good. All right. Uh, so, uh, candidates, as you look forward to the future of Raleigh, what gives you hope? Uh, it's our people. So we live in a wonderful community made up of diverse backgrounds and people that have moved from out of state or out of the country, come here to, to receive an education or come here to found jobs, and our people are what give me hope. Um, I, I coach youth ice hockey. I, I deal with various you know different families. I had this I had this young man named Bara uh, two seasons ago. This kid was eight years old, never played hockey. His family was from Sudan, I believe. Uh, had no idea what they were doing, putting hockey skates on their little boy, but he saw the Hurricanes on TV and he wanted to play ice hockey. He ended up being one of my favorite kids I've ever coached. And it's, the answer is the people. The people of Raleigh uh, and the surrounding area would give me hope, and that's who I'd like to represent. Yeah. It's, it's definitely the people. Um, I think of Raleigh as the Goldilocks city. It's not too big, it's not too small, it's just right. And keeping it just right is really, really tough. It is a balancing act. We're gonna grow how we grow, how we do that. I wanna do it together. I wanna do it with you. I want to understand where you're coming from. And so in you know running for council, you know, I am thinking about you know my neighbors every day that I'm not here doing these kind of forums I am talking to neighbors in Renaissance Park I'm knocking on doors um, in West Raleigh I'm over in Method Park and so I'm learning I'm learning every day you know what people are dealing with what they're excited about um, you know they they love this they love the city and so it's just a, a great place to be and yeah I feel very fortunate to be here thank you Todd so I think what, what gives me hope, and uh, I'll repeat what Rob said, uh, first of all, is, is our people, uh, it's our diversity, and it's our resilience as a city. Uh, we came together during the pandemic uh, and really supported one another. Um, and, you know, we were, we're starting to come out of that difficult time uh, in our city. And so I want to see us advance policies that help build on that uh, resilience and I, I, I get the feeling that most Riley residents also can get behind an idea of advancing policies that advance 
prosperity for everyone in the city of Raleigh. I'll echo much of what they said. What, what gives me hope it is um, the people, but it, it's the things that we're able to sit down and do together. We are willing to be progressive. We're willing to talk about sustainability, about changing systems um, around zoning and around police. We're willing to come together and talk about uh, how we want our city to be. Uh, and really, I'm building uh, my campaign and all my conversations. I've, I've resonated um, with neighbors because they want to see us move past saying no to things or saying yes to things and talk about how things get better. Uh, my little son um, at a community meeting a few years ago during the pandemic, we had outside in the park at a playground and he got to participate in his first community meeting and they said, what are the challenges in your neighborhood? What are the assets in your neighborhood? What do you want to see? And his little hand shot up. And he said, I want to see more friends, more neighbors to play with. And I want to see restaurants I can walk and bike to. Um, and every day, my kids give me that hope. And I see it reflected back when I have meetings with neighbors, that hope that we can do better and build more uh, together. Thank you very much. So it is time. You've made it to the end. Uh, closing statements. We'll begin with Jane. One minute. Okay. Thank you all again for being here, for staying with us through the heat. Um, I'm, I'm glistening here, so it's, it's lovely. Um, you know, what I offer uh, is myself. I am here as, as just an individual who will offer what I believe a truly independent voice on council that will represent her neighbors. I am going to be in conversation with y'all. I am going to tell you when I get things wrong. When you come to throw tomatoes at me during public comment, I'm going to take it. <laughs> and if it's reasonable, I'm going to say you I think we have to have that opportunity for dialogue. And I'm going to tell you again, when I've got it wrong, I'm going to say I'm sorry, and then I'm going to try to do better. And if you all are willing to do that with me, then I look forward to this November. And if you want to go for someone else, I'm going to take a great vacation. Um, but it's wonderful to be here with y'all. Can I clap now? No? Not yet. <laughs> So, in, in close, Raleigh's future is bright. How bright that future depends on what we do to steer it in the right direction. We need to push forward policies now that make Raleigh more prosperous, more resilient, and more inclusive for everyone. This campaign is built on ideas to make that happen. It's built on a style that seeks common ground and an elevated tone because we have got to get beyond the discord and divisiveness. But most importantly, uh, this campaign is built on experience as a leader in the community, on issues of affordable housing, the environment, and inclusion, combined with a 25-year career in a public infrastructure and the environment. <clears throat> I bring more relevant experience to this position than anyone else in this race. Experience matters. And we're going to be taking that message to the voters of District D. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I started tonight talking about how Raleigh is at a critical moment. Uh, I want to leave you guys with that idea. We have made um, progressive moves over the past few years that could really change our city for the better. We need to continue that momentum. But we also need to go back to the basics on some of our service, things that have been exposed by the pandemic um, around busing, around equity, around housing. Uh, I'm committed to doing that. I have a track record of doing that for the 15 years I've lived in the district, in my professional work, in my personal work, in my personal time, my volunteer time, and with partnering organizations all over the district and the city. Um, Many of you know that because you've met me through that. Uh, what I need um, to win in November is your support to help spread that word. So I'd like to close tonight by asking for your support and asking for your vote. Um, you can go to my website and see more about my policy issues than you were able to hear in the minute tonight, and you'll see the depth of knowledge and commitment to understanding uh, what it takes to actually govern. 
So again, my name is Rob Baumgart. It's right there on the on the placard. Um, I am not involved in as many boards or have as much political policy making experience as the other candidates on the on the council up here uh, on the forum do. However, I do have a background of being a small business owner, uh, a background of being a landlord here in town, a uh, background of being a father uh, here and, and raising my children here. Uh, I love this city. Uh, I would love to see the city uh, grow in a thoughtful manner. Uh, that is uh, making sure we look out for the lowest of those or you know, the people who are struggling to make it. Uh, and that's who I would care about. I am not uh, backed by any large developers. We had that question earlier. Uh, I am running as, as myself, Rob Baumgart. Uh, and I'll leave you with this last thought. I am the number one candidate based on alphabetical order. <laughs> So when you go to the polls, it will help me. I heard it actually gives you like four, four points. So uh, I know I'm voting for myself on November 8th. Uh, if, if you would like to vote for me too, I'm the guy on top. So in, uh, in wrapping up, I just want to uh, give you a couple of reminders. Uh, check your voter registration to ensure it's accurate, up to date. Uh, as we noted earlier, early voting runs from October 20th to November 5th. Election day is November 8th. Uh, you can contact the candidates after our forum and through individual information that can be found on vote411.org. It's a great website sponsored by the State Board of Elections. Uh, I want to thank all of you for attending and being so engaged. Thank Trophy for uh, their hosting all the partners. Certainly nothing goes together like uh, beer and politics. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank the candidates uh, deeply for putting themselves forward to serve the citizens of Raleigh. Rob, Jane, Todd, Jennifer, thank you very much. So y'all